Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Well, uh, we have just discussed uh, ecology-based uh, model in human ecology and also the actor-based model in human ecology approach. Now, what we have just discussed in the first part of uh, how ecology should be given importance, unlike the pioneer or traditionalist who were engaging in trying to understand the relationship between ecology and uh, human society. They tries to understand by trying to inject the sort of cultural adaptation to human environment, but rather uh, Roy Rappaport to some extent has bring a new avatar in terms of trying to understand the ecology and human society. Rather than explicitly giving, in, giving importance to the cultural adaptation to environment, he tries to engage in looking at how ecology and uh, the human society rather has interrelate or the kind of relationship which human society has shared with the ecosystem. Now, in that it tries to establish uh, the way human tries to make sense of uh, the environment by engaging in certain kinds of uh, rituals and ceremonies. And these rituals and ceremonies to some extent might appear to be something which is uh, maladaptive but rather if you look at the manifest function or rather looking at the amic uh, perspective, it tends to serve uh, a purpose for the Sembaga community which he strongly or uh, provocatively discuss uh, in his work picks for the ancestors. Now in that book, in that work which uh, Rappaport has looked at the slaughter of pigs is not to be seen in terms of the numbers of animals which are killed at one go or at a time, but rather it has to be seen as the kind of needs or necessity which that particular social rituals demands for. Because as we had uh, discussed, uh, pigs are normally slaughtered when uh, people really come back uh, quite exhausted or they really need some kind of nutrition uh, for consumption. So therefore, at that point of time when people really need uh, that kind of uh, supply of nutrition, a number of pigs are being slaughtered and it is being treated. Now, similarly, if we try to posit that example in the context of the actor based uh, model in human ecology, it is also to do with how an individual success or status in the society is also being defined by the kind of or the number of pigs an individual rear. Because uh, the more number of pig one has possessed or one as uh, belong then or owned rather uh, it, it tends to sort of uh, gives a lot of value or status where an individual occupies in the social structure. Now therefore human ecology in human ecology it is also important to identify 
where an individual tries to you know situate oneself in trying to make sense of uh, one's positions in relationship with the ecosystem. Now, there can be uh, different processes in terms of trying to make sense of how an individual takes certain decisions in the interest to their environment is perhaps a valuable approach for understanding how change occurs in social system also in response to the environmental perturbation. Now, to some extent this actor based model approach is also useful in order to understand how traditional farmers accept or reject certain kind of agriculture innovations. Now, if we look further uh, by the study which is made by uh, Michael Morkman way back in 1968, he cited an example of how an individual tries to explain or those peasant rice uh, farmers in the northern Thailand tends to explain the kind of adaptations which they have undergoes over a period of uh, certain times. Now, usually the kind of evolution which takes place in agriculture in terms of technology is the finer the technology is people tends to engage in using certain kind of heavy machines like tractors. Now, for instance, uh, what Michael uh, tends to you know uh, find out from his study is uh, in northern Thailand, there are a lot of farmers who adopted to these uh, tractors under certain kind of uh, certain specific environments, while others still continues to use the traditional modes of uh, plowing, for instance, by using this water buffalo under other circumstances. Now, in this, you can actually see how an actor or the individual tends to reorient or tries to make sense of the changing circumstances of the environment by uh, exploiting or adapting to uh, exploiting certain kinds of technology by adapting to certain environmental circumstances. Now, it is also interesting to you know uh, see certain kinds of societies where they tends to come up with different uh, modes of behavior in terms of uh, relying on certain uh, nearby technology in order to adapt or to overcome certain kinds of obstacles in their environment circumstances, uh, which I will of course try to explain in the upcoming lectures in a further more detailed of certain case studies which are being conducted. Now, uh, similar to what uh, Michael has explained, uh, these kind of practices in terms of how uh, the farmers in a way are receptive to changes and also still continues with the kind of uh, traditional modes of farming has to some extent uh, tends to show that how an individual uh, evolve oneself in terms of the changing environment circumstances. He also further tends to show that there is uh, an urging willingness from uh, the farmers uh, in the country of uh, Thailand. They tends to you know engage in improving uh, rice plantation by adapting to varieties of uh, you know food crops like for instance the rash, uh, rational uh, consideration of environmental forces which in a sense affect the crop yields which means in order to have a uh, much more bigger output uh, the farmers tends to engage in trying to use uh, different kinds of food grains 
food grains altogether, which in essence uh, in the long run enhances to their productivity. Now, by saying so, uh, there has been uh, a sort of a presumption that most of the farmers from the Asian countries are tends to be seen as uh, which are not complying or sort of uh, resisting uh, this modern technology. But then from this particular uh, case study which is being carried out by Michael uh, in, the context, in the context of Thai farmers, it is evident that the pigeons tends to uh, posit that they are highly uh, receptive to change if not they are uh, uh, rational decision makers who tends to carefully observe and assess the kind of agriculture innovations in terms of uh, the potential benefits and cost. Now, usually traditional farmers are uh, not really attuned to you know measuring these uh, benefits and cost uh, because for instance uh, many of the case studies if you look at uh, in terms of the slush and burned agriculture or Sweden agriculture or sifting agriculture in this type of uh, farming if you actually see from uh, an economic perspective the amount of labor or uh, investment which is being done in terms of the cultivations and if you tends to measure with output uh, there is this sort of like uh, an imbalances because usually the output is slow in compare with the kind of investment which is or labor which is being invested in that parts of farming. But in the context of uh, this uh, the Thai farmers it is interesting to see the kind of how they are willing to you know evolve themselves and uh, to bring out certain kind of innovations in the context of this agriculture. Now, because they have been following this modes of uh, trying to see the potential benefits and of course, the cost. Now, in this very context, despite uh, the promise of higher yields, modern cropping methods are often rejected simply because such innovations may require high inputs of fertilizers, pesticides and water. And these are something which of course is being witnessed across the globe. Now, for instance, uh, when we talk about green revolution, no doubt the benefits and the kind of output, the productivity is enormous, but they can't do away without relying on this kind of, uh, you know, using fertilizers, pesticides and of course, uh, different kinds of uh, technology. And having known all this, to some extent, uh, the many of the farmers are, you know, not receptive to such kind of innovations because or owing to their poor economic backgrounds. And therefore, these modern cropping methods are also much more in a way uh, harmful or vulnerable to the environmental hazards such as floods, droughts and insects and disease outbreaks. Now, these are some of the you know uh, the negative the possible negative outcome if one engages in using these the modern cropping methods. And apart from this it is also evident that once a different kinds of variety of seeds or crops is being grown uh, or introducing introduced in a new area or geographical space, there are chances of you know uh, altering the kind of uh, soil nutrients and also at the same time there is an excessive uh, weights which come along with this kind of food crops. So, these are some of the sort of apprehensions which are usually being uh, encountered when a farmer tends to uh, introduce some kind of uh, a newer things uh, 
uh, which were normally not usually practiced in that particular area. Now, going back to the examples of what uh, we have seen from the, the Sambaga community in New Guinea, an individual in the Sambaga community, in a, in a way, tries to you know uh, raise the largest possible extent of pigs, not because that uh, is the optimum strategy for adapting to the kind of environment which these people have uh, lived on, but rather because that is perhaps the way in which he can, as I said, enhance in terms of improving one status in the social structure of that particular society that is the Sambaga society. Now, citing that parallel example, if we see in the context of the Thai farmers again, they choose to you know grow a variety of rices, for instance the variety A instead of uh, the rice variety B, because the farmer believes that it will give him a higher uh, output from his uh, agricultural land and also a higher yield will allow him to you know uh, give him a much more uh, standard of living which in a way is considered to be uh, good in terms of the Thai cultures. Now when we talk about culture it is also about the social accept acceptability or the kind of values which uh, not just the individual, but other members of the society also give equal meaning and values to that particular practices. Now, when a Thai farmers in a way engage in this kind of agriculture innovations or in, try, in trying to uh, practice a different forms of cropping system or farming rather, it is considered to be uh, goods in terms in, re in relationship with the Thai society. Now, therefore, these kinds of decisions may or may not be uh, justified or correct ones within the context of their cultural values, but they as an individual did not create these values, then who creates this value? Instead, the values are pre-existing aspect of the social system into which these individuals were born. Now, sometime uh, the kind of decisions which an individual tends to engage upon may not be conform or may be accepted from that particular uh, cultural values, but instead these values are seen to be which is more of a pre-existing aspect of the social system into which an individuals are socialized and born. Now, as a children, as human being uh, tends to grow up, they were socialized to accept these values as something which is uh, seen to be correct and uh, and, and which needs to be conformed by the other individual members and as adults they tend to grow up and then when they become adults they make their choice about their interactions with the environment in terms of those values. Now those values are not something which is uh, embedded within the culture but it is being a learning process an ongoing process the way in which an individual as they becomes an, an adult interact with the environment and so is the kind of value which is being uh, uh, shown upon the environment. So, people tend to in a way uh, evolve themselves in sort of socializing at the same time interacting with their environments in terms of the kind of values it is being attached. Now, uh, the farmers maybe 50 years back might associate themselves to their environment not necessarily in terms of 
the amount of, of the crops which is going to be yield or the output which is going to come. Rather, it is more of a regular practices uh, because those days they were being guided by the idea of sort of subsistence. But as time change and then so as uh, an individual evolve, the kind of environment uh, they tend to perceive about also changes because they tend to see uh, any agriculture land as something which is not just giving them a subsistence adequate for their means of livelihood. Rather, they tend to measure in terms of the kind of uh, surplus value which also will uh, give them from that particular agriculture land. Now, in a way people are no longer being uh, guided by that subsistence uh, modes of ideas, but rather in terms of the market oriented or the modern uh, market system is how an individual's ideas or uh, modes of behaviors are being influenced. Therefore, under this in this very context, it is important to see or locate director based uh, model of human ecology and uh, this per perhaps can be seen as one of the lim limited applications of this particular model. And also it can reveal uh, a great deal about why individual within the particular social system make such kind of particular choices about their interactions with the environment that they do is because uh, one cannot really explain uh, why their social system present them with the particular choices uh, it does. Now, this is perhaps uh, one, one thing which cannot be really explained by this uh, actor based model of human ecology and, and that perhaps is the kind of uh, limitations of that particular model. Now, after discussing uh, the ecology based uh, models of human ecology and actor based uh, model of human ecology, we will try to see uh, the third one that is the system model which is much more of a generalized or general system theory, which in a sense is concerned with the uh, general properties uh, of the structures and functions of system. Remember the structures and functions of system as such rather than within their specific contents. Rather than giving a specific explanations of maybe the latent functions or manifest functions. Uh, in this particular system model, it tends to look at both the structures and functions of systems uh, in a much more generalized structure. Now, according to these uh, particular theoretical approach, uh, for example, say atoms, cells, organism, ecosystem, societies and even the universe as a whole together share the common properties of being self-organizing system and can therefore be uh, studied in terms of a common theoretical perspective. That is by using a particular single uh, theoretical perspective, we can study all this uh, in a much more holistic or as a whole because they are sort of a properties which is self organizing systems. Now, let us uh, begin with trying to see from uh, uh, a French sociologist Emile Durkheim, uh, wherein the, he, he was sort of the pioneers in terms of looking at this uh, functionalist perspective or structural functionalism. Now, uh, Durkheim way back in 1915 come up with his work called the elementary forms of religious life that is how primitive societies engage upon bringing up certain kinds of their religious belief or what perhaps can be the uh, basic uh, rudimentary forms of religion 
what are the kind of functions it tends to religion has played in the context of uh, societies uh, even in the most most uh, simple form of society. Now, this particular works perhaps uh, provide one of uh, the basis for the development of the, the structural functional social system models. Now, Durkheim tends to see how peoples engage in looking at uh, the kind of belief system they have. For instance, the totemism. Now, what is totemism? Totemism is a religious belief that uh, you tends to sort of uh, give sort of respect or a belief that uh, some certain kinds of supernatural forces or spirits dwell in certain kinds of say plants, animals or any kind of part certain objects and then you give certain kind of reverence to this uh, and this perhaps in a sense uh, guide that particular individual if not the society. Now, in this elementary forms of religious life, Durkheim tries to see that explain how a religion is pretty much to be seen uh, from the kind of functions it serves to the uh, society as a whole. Now, the second form of uh, approach uh, so to say the structural functionalism were also uh, firstly articulated by some of the pioneer anthropologists like Radcliffe Brown, uh, Malinowski and also being uh, empirically studied by Ewan Spritzert and also by Raymond Furt. So, all these uh, diverse institutions of society as seem to be organized into an integrated system, where its institutions fits harmoniously with every other one and where change in any single institution would uh, sort of ramify into a complementary change in all the other institutions with which it was functionally connected. Now, what Durkheim actually posit was he tends to see society as the first form of organization where how religion in a sense is being uh, created. Now, for Durkheim uh, society perhaps is the society itself in a way is a religion and it is through this religious belief the members of the society are being integrated and certain kinds of sort of a solidarity is being uh, uh, manifested in the context of uh, what Durkheim tries to look at. Now, let us try to explain further what structural functionalism models tries to actually uh, talks about. It tends to you know uh, uh, looked at societies as a system which proved to be of great value not just operationally, but also by producing many new insights into the ways in which societies were perhaps being organized. Now, for instance, uh, certain kind of uh, practices which were prevalent in the traditional society can be given here as an example. Now, uh, one of the you know like simple so to say or maybe uh, outmoded in the uh, modern parlance. For instance, the payment of bride price if you look at in many of the tribal societies which in a sense can be antithetical to the dowry system which is practiced in the uh, caste Hindu society. Now, uh, this kind of bride price which was pretty much prevalent in tribal societies in essence became comprehensible when it is it was perceived that it in essence uh, sort of uh, served to strengthen the kind of 
uh, matrimonial uh, bonds which exist uh, in terms of for instance the making div divorce more difficult and that such strengthening was important since marriage served politically to unite otherwise autonomous clans. Now, I am sure you must have come across uh, certain uh, terms such as matrimonial alliances where uh, in olden time certain kings used to you know as a sort of a homage if not uh, an honor tends to give away their daughters to certain ki uh, neighboring kings in order to have a sort of uh, a quarter relations politically. Now, uh, not adequate to that, but uh, in a way you can give an examples of that. Now, similarly, there are different warring, I mean, uh, warring communities, and uh, they tend to exchange their daughters, so that it also ensures some kind of uh, a peaceful environments, uh, because they tend to share some kind of kinship relations as a practice of this. Now, as a result of this, it serves some kind of a functional uh, perspective or a functional purpose. Now, these sort of practices which was predominant uh, in earlier societies were perhaps perceived to be seen as a quaint or something which is uh, a savage custom. But if you look at uh, of those practices now, those were now recognized as assessing, uh, serving a, a very important function in the maintenance of uh, a tribal social solidarity. Now, those kind of practices, if you looked at uh, the kind of Latin functions it serves, that is the ethic, can to some extent be seen as sort of uh, the backbone of how social solidarity is being established between different uh, clan groups in the same maybe uh, tribe or maybe across different tribes. Now, those kind of practices if you see from a structural functional model, it does serve a purpose and it has to be seen from that particular context. Now, going further, uh, Durkheim uh, come up with uh, a terminology called social facts. Now, what does social facts mean? Social facts uh, to Durkheim has to be sort of explained only in terms of other social facts. That is how things has to be seen in relation to others. That is one could not seek uh, or explain the causes of social change outside the boundaries of the social system itself. It has to be uh, explained and seen in the context of that particular social system. Now, therefore, it is important to you know interpret or make sense of uh, an explanation uh, from that particular uh, context of that society. Now, similarly the development of human ecology also has to be located or seen uh, in a way as an attempt to escape this particular theoretical um, impasse by treating social system as open rather than closed system. Now, it has to be seen in a much more uh, vibrant and how it has uh, is the social system is also being influenced by the uh, existing ecosystem. Now, similarly therefore, the works of uh, Julian Stewart which we perhaps uh, have discussed in the context of this uh, how cultural ecology has emerges. Now, what Julian Stewart uh, has 
tries to explain or uh, rather a propound is it tends to recognize the social facts and these social facts must be explained not only in terms of other social facts, but also in terms of ecological facts. Then now what, what then is ecological facts? Now ecological facts also has to be premised in that particular ecosystem as what Durkheim has used in social facts that is to be seen within that social system. Now as we had given an example of that bright price, the bright price has to be explained in terms of the applicability within that context, how it tends to you know sort of uh, cater to the needs of in bringing the social solidarity of that particular society. And similarly, in cultural ecology, things has to be seen in terms of how the human society, their cultures are more or less related with the ecology or how ecology is adapting or making sense or functional of that environment. Now, in this general system approach, it is to be seen as uh, more of an alternative approach, uh, the kind of the system model of this human ecology in a sense uh, tends to uh, sort of uh, emphasize the social system as they interact with the ecological system. Now, for instance, uh, usually we talk about what adaptation uh, is assumed to occur not to be seen as not just at the level of discrete cultural traits or social institutions as in the model of uh, cultural ecology or maybe in terms of the specific human population as in the ecosystem based model of human ecology. Rather, uh, it has to be seen in totality that is the total system, the total system as a system. One should not engage in trying to see breaking up with coming up with different uh, espousing different kinds of models, but rather it has to be seen as a total social system. This is something which is uh, being seen from the system models of human ecology. Now, going back to what uh, Stewart in a sense explained or trying to bring in this cultural traits in trying to make sense of the environment cultural trait uh, does not in a sense necessarily tries to uh, function to ensure the welfare of either individuals or the local populations, but instead it uh, primarily tends to serve uh, to ensure the survival of the social system itself, which means it gives uh, primary importance to the social systems rather than the individual or the local populations. Now, if one stands to see from this perspective, if we give a, I mean the we uh, cite an example of the Sambaga community where uh, the ritually regulated warfare of uh, the Sambaga is not to be seen as something which is directly benefiting either most of the individuals or the local population as a whole right now either the individuals nor the local population in a sense benefit from this kind of engaging in warfare rather in this system of this model of this human ecology both the social system and the ecosystem with which it interacts remember the interactions between the social system and the ecosystem retain their integrity as a system with it changing its structural configurations according to its internal dynamics. Now, when we talk about the structural configurations, we can see the amount or the numbers of pigs which are being slaughtered and the internal dynamics is something which that slaughtering of the pigs serve the purpose 
for that particular community which uh, they engage in that particular rituals. Now, the system models of human e ecology as we had discussed further emphasizes four relational aspects. Now, the first one is uh, the inputs from the ecosystem into the social system. These inputs uh, for example, uh, are in the forms of flows of energy uh, may be the food uh, or may be the petroleum the, and, and also it has uh, material aspects like protein construction so on and so forth or maybe an information like the sounds, the visual stimuli. So, all these things in a way uh, is partly the kind of relational aspect which is being uh, focuses in the system model of human ecology. Now, the second is the inputs from the social systems into the ecosystem. The first one is the ecosystem into the social system and the second is the social system into the ecosystem. Again, these in a way can take the form of the flows of energy, materials or information generated by human activities. Now, the third is change in the institutions making up of the uh, social system in response to the ecosystem. That is how the institutions tends to uh, see the social system in response to the ecosystem. Maybe an often are adaptive you, uh, that is they contribute to the continuing survival of the social system under the changed environmental conditions. In other words, uh, this social system itself rather than the people who are involved in it that is the individuals that is the unit of natural selections and adaptations. Now, the social system in a sense is given much more importance here again. Now, the four uh, types of these operational systems is the changes in uh, the ecosystem in response to the inputs from the social system. Now, just as human society changes uh, in response to the environmental influences, so does the ecosystem change in response to human influences. So, there is this sort of uh, a vice versa kind of relationship. Remember, the environment also has changes because of the influences of human. The kind of activity, any amount of activity has certain kind of implications on the ecosystem and such genes in essence may be either primary or may be the direct impact of a human activity on an ecosystem component such as the killing of a particular species, maybe a bird, maybe uh, uprooting maybe a small plant or maybe animal species by over hunting or a secondary alteration in other ecosystem components caused by anthropogenic primary chains in, in one component. Now, therefore, we as an individual as or as a human, the kind of uh, activity which we uh, normally engage upon minimally to some extent has a changes on the ecosystem. Now, the point of uh, what we have discussed in this uh, four emphasis within the system model approach is the point of discussion is that the kind of relationship between the social system and the ecosystem is both complex and dynamic. Now, why is it complex and why is it dynamic? Because uh, the virtue of the system of this model of human ecology is that it focuses attention on the processes of change and adaptation rather than emphasizing the static structural characteristic of the social and ecological system. It, it, it tries to see the process of change and adaptation rather than uh, emphasizing on the static structural characteristic. 
Moreover, this system approach uh, avoids any necessity for specification of a universal prime mover for change. Neither environmental nor social factors have any a priori primacy because impulses for change may flow in either directions. It can be uh, negative, it can be positive. So, the impulses for change uh, uh, can flow in any particular directions. Therefore, there is no inherent uh, contradiction between the system model and the actor model uh, of human ecology. Because uh, apparently, it might sound that the actor based model ap uh, based approach and the system model approach may contradict. Because uh, the latter approach is simply one among many that can be incorporated with the larger social system framework. Certainly, uh, the kind of decision making which an individual participants may be in the context of the Thai farmers as we had discussed affects both the character of the social system and its interactions with the ecosystem. But has already been discussed all these decisions are being made within the context of this system. And within this perhaps the greatest virtue of the system model of human ecology is that it tends to espouse offer certain kind of specific guidelines for doing research on human interactions with the environment. It does not limit itself in to a single uh, specific uh, model in terms of looking at uh, the relationship between human and ecology. Rather, this system model uh, approach in a way can uh, usher in a different kinds of understanding for a further holistic understanding of doing uh, research in terms of the human interactions with the environment. Now, uh, as we have uh, discussed the different forms of models of human ecology and how or to what extent the different models are being followed in trying to make sense of human ecology that is the society or the actor based model approach or maybe society based model of human ecology. All these are to be seen in the context of how it tends to sort of to be located. Now, as we had seen uh, in the 70s and the 80s, there is an emergence of certain kind of uh, a radical cultural relativism. and. Uh, and in the 1990s again the ecological anthropologists rejected this extreme form of this uh, cultural relativism and, uh, and, and accordingly tends to disagree with the modernist dichotomies that is body and mind action and thought and nature and culture. The, this was uh, uh, argued by Milton in way back in 1977. Now, recently in the ecological anthropology, uh, ecological studies, they tend to include the political ecology aspect as well by uniting more traditional concerns for the environment, technology, social organization nexus. Remember these uh, incorporations of new ideas that is how technology is brought in trying to understand or the relations between environment and social organization, the nexus of this particular uh, system. With the emphasis of this political economy on power and inequality seen historically, the evaluations and critic of how the third world development programs and the analysis of environmental degradation. Now, when we talk about political ecology or the uh, political economy on power. 
it tends to see how maybe the kind of trade off which actually happens in the context of environment and development uh, discourse and uh, who actually benef benefit and then who actually is taking the decisions in terms of certain kinds of policies and programs which are being initiated by the uh, policy makers. Now, these are partly something which are of a newer field where the ecological anthropologist studies also tends to uh, delve upon. It. Now, what does uh, to what states or what ha what what uh, kind of situations are we into and then uh, the journey so far. The an anthropological knowledge has been advanced by ecological approaches, the applications of this uh, biological ecology to cultural anthropology in a sense adds a new scientific perspective to the discipline and also ecological anthrop anthropology contribute to the development of extended models of sustainability for humankind through research and study with indigenous peoples in an ecological framework anthropologists uh, engage upon learning more about the intimate interactions between humans and their environment. Now, perhaps as uh, in the beginning lectures which I gave, I talked about why in this um, modern parlance in the context of ecological crisis, why is it important to see or bring in the ecological anthropological anthropology disciplines in trying to make sense of how the indigenous peoples are to be located in the context of a particular ecological framework and through this kind of continuous engagement, uh, scholars are engaged upon learning more about the kind of sort of interrelationship uh, or the interactions which is shared by the humans and their environment. And within this framework, one tends to you know posit equations of uh, how sustainably they were able to use or manage ma manage their resources. Now, in this uh, newer forms of understanding and development, in the 1990s, this field that is the ecological anthropology has enhanced a uh, subjective understanding or perception of the consequences of development of the imagined. Now, today usually how do we perceive development and then how do we try to locate development in the context of the indigenous people and how is development uh, to some extent benefiting or uh, being a destruction to many of those indigenous society. Now, development is also highly debated and uh, mostly uh, if we try to see from in the context of environment and development, uh, the perception or the understanding of uh, development in the context of the north that is the developed countries and the south that is uh, the third world countries is also different. The kind of engagement which people tends to perceive about the natural resources is also different. Now, the management of natural resources in the north that is uh, mostly in the developed countries is seen as something more of a romanticization or if not a recreational framework or is seen as more of uh, enhancing their means of livelihood or well-being. But in the context of the South that is in the third world countries, resources are seen as something which is pretty much embedded with their means of livelihood. Now, in this particular debate and uh, discourses, one also needs to locate or understands the debate of this environment and development. Now, this presence of this perhaps talks about how 
in the Amazon or the Amazon forests are being depleted as a result of the kind of uh, development projects which are being initiated. Now, this presence of ecology or an interdisciplinary understanding uh, which are being initiated by the uh, within the discipline of ecological anthropology uh, adds sort of uh, a new dimensions in terms of the theory and the methods which uh, the research in, in this particular paradigm. So, one needs to look or maybe this uh, ecology and, and ecosystem and anthropology adds up a new dimensions uh, into these approaches. Thus, uh, ecological investigations in a sense bring uh, sort of an additional uh, hybrid we go to the field of anthropology and uh, we will try to look further uh, into some of the works of the ecological anthropologists uh, in particular and the anthropologists in general and also some of the works of uh, the philosophers who works in the field of uh, ecology and environment and also some environmentalists uh, who deeply engage upon in trying to make sense of the human environment interactions. Now, uh, this would be cover up in the uh, upcoming lectures and uh, I will stop here.